Ladies and gentlemen, let's start this with Swiss precision timing, 5 o'clock, Friday, 25th of May. What very warm welcome from the Parish Network to um, our anniversary symposium. I'm very grateful uh, to you for having responded uh, to our call for participation. For us, it's a little bit of a cause of celebration. Um, it's, as I said, the 10th anniversary symposium. We started back in 2003, and since then we've had an annual series of meetings on themes as diverse as clergy, sources, rituals, piety, marginals, and material culture. This year represents a new departure for us, a more open survey of the field and a much wider range of delegates who can all contribute what we hope will be a better understanding of parish studies today. We left nothing to chance. As you can see, the weather has been organized for the conference um, as well. So, why parishes? What justifies so much attention to small local communities? I see a host of motives. Certainly, the towering role of religion, particularly in pre-modern society, but also the constant overspill of the parish into secular, political, and cultural spheres. Plus, we have an extensive survival of buildings, hundreds if not thousands of perpendicular churches up and down the country. Here in the neighborhood, Barkswell, Coventry, Warwick, you name it, it's wherever you go, literally, you stumble across this survival. But I think it's mainly three reasons, for me at least, that justify a closer engagement. Firstly, the universality of the parish framework throughout Europe, which allows us insights into common features as well as regional differences. Secondly, the parish's social inclusiveness, which means that researchers get access not just to elites, but also the common people, including women. As you can see here quite nicely in this uh, early 16th century chronicle, it's the whole community that's going to church. It's a procession uh, to the main building of the village. And you can see it's the only building that is built in stone. All the others are constructed in wood. It's on the one hand a harmonious community, but on the other hand it's also intensely structured. You can see at the, at the front of the procession, the choristers or the people in holy orders, then the backbone of the pre-modern community, the male householders, and then at the back, uh, the women and the children. So an inclusive approach um, to pre-modern history. And thirdly, the parish is an unrivaled contact zone where the universal Christianity, the church as a whole, intersects with the local, the peculiar topographies, the customs, and the people of a particular locality. And last but not least, we're spoiled by a plentiful source survival, especially in England, which includes archives of ecclesiastical courts, bells, bishops' registers, chronicles, church wardens' accounts, deeds, graveyards, highway maintenance records, indulgences, inventories, memoranda, musical manuscripts, monuments, overseers' accounts, parish registers, service books, statues, surveys, tithe maps, vestry minutes, visitation records, wall paintings, wills, and I think you get the message. There's quite a lot we could possibly look at. And the simple truth is no single person or organization can cope with all of this. Hence, researchers need to come together exchange information and discuss new ways in which we can get the most out of this rich heritage. How can we make sense then of a thousand years of parish history? Which methods have researchers pursued to investigate different aspects of parish life and parish culture? The short and reassuring answer, it's a multiplicity of different complementary and sometimes conflicting approaches. From the earliest investigations in the 19th and early 20th century, people like J.C. Cox and Charles Drew, we've seen a huge variety of experiments and investigations. Just a few examples may be highlighted here. 
In terms of disciplines, we've encountered anthropologists studying gender, rituals, and customs. Archaeologists uh, doing excavations, thinking about the origins and the spatial evolutions. Architectural scholars have looked at styles, materials, techniques, conservation work. Art historians examine wall paintings, images, and ornaments. Ecclesiastical historians deal with diocesan frameworks, with benefices, with tithes, with the clergy, with, cannot, with canon law. Genealogists examine family history and lineage. Social historians are interested in office holders, boundaries, demography. Musicologists study plain chant, polyphony, organs, bells. Theologians concerned, of course, with doctrines, beliefs, and the different paths to salvation. Ever more common and ever more welcome, I think, are interdisciplinary projects combining different scholarly traditions. And a prime example we'll hear later on tonight when John Harper is going to talk about worship. Looking at methods, most, I think, follow one of two basic routes. Some pursue qualitative studies. So in-depth case studies of events, individuals, mentalities. Others prefer quantitative approaches, dealing with numbers, serial sources, and long-term trends. And there is an enormous range of combinations of the two at the same time. As for perspective, some prefer a local approach, an interest in one's own or a particularly unusual community, either individually or as a member of a society. Then there are microhistorians zooming in on a single town or village as if placing them under a microscope, studying the grassroots impact of general trends, looking at the extraordinary to understand the normal that much better. And then there are comparative approaches which embed case studies into why the diocesan, the regional, territorial or international contexts, and the list, of course, could go on. Even after all these efforts, of course, we still have many dark areas, numerous questions without answers and miles of archival documents that nobody has really looked at in any detail. Where can we gain some general guidance? Who can explain the larger picture, the big developments over time, the ways in which parishes reflected and in turn shaped the larger issues of the past? Topics such as community formation from about the year 1000, the emergence of canon law requirements and lay officers like church wardens from the 13th century, the impact of the Black Death of the mid-14th century, the increase of divine service in the late Middle Ages, the fundamental changes, transformations of the various reformations of the 16th century, the religious divisions and civil wars of the 17th century, the first experiments with toleration from around 1700 in this country, the processes of industrialization and urbanization, particularly striking in the Victorian age, and the challenges of a largely secularized and multicultural society as in the present. One excellent resource to tackle this is the English parish church through, this, uh, through the centuries, a DVD produced by our symposium partner, Christianity and Culture, to which many of you I'm sure, will have contributed. Over 200 academics were involved in this um, survey work, and on top of the latest research, you'll find musical samples, videos, 3D modeling, and countless illustrations. For Europe as a whole, sadly, such a survey is still lacking, but there are many regional or period uh, general works. Here, I've highlighted one from Germany, Hungary, Bohemia, Moravia, and Poland, at least for the medieval period. So maybe to aim towards a European comparison, a larger survey work for Europe might be one of the projects that the network uh, could be interested in. So where do parish studies stand at this moment? What seems of primary interest to the researchers today? Well, we just heard that we cannot and should not generalize, the best impression will emerge from attending the sessions, I think, over this weekend. There are, of course, a great number of excellent local studies and microhistories. Just think of, famously, Earl's Colne, with all the website 
uh, literally including all the sources that survive. And hopefully there will be many more such microhistories in the future. But to me personally, three trends or turns look particularly prominent at the moment. First, the new cultural history, that is the attempt to complement the traditional focus on facts, individuals, figures and structures with greater sensitivity to people's perceptions, how they memorized the past, and the forms in which they represented themselves to the outside world. Here we can gain much from engaging with anthropology, literary studies, art history, gender history, and musicology. Our first workshop tonight will address one of this, the oral dimension of um, the parish community. Secondly, the spatial turn, that is the realization that the environment in which we find ourselves and in which people of the past found themselves, are not simply given. They're not just like an inert container, but the result of a momentary construction involving factors like companions, mental horizons, objects, and atmospheric elements. Here, archaeologists, geographers, and sociologists are often at the forefront. See, for instance, the recent essay collections we've had on sacred space published in England and in Germany. And thirdly, the so-called material turn, meaning a greater sensitivity to the ways humans commission, create, and interact with objects, but also the inherent qualities of materials and the emotive responses they can foster. Several sessions this weekend will focus on this vibrant field. To have any chance, I think, of even thinking about how to integrate these developments, therefore, what we need to do is interact. Exchange across all periods, approaches and backgrounds is thus one of the primary aims of this symposium. What do I mean by this? Well, first of all, I should tell you perhaps a little about the organisation that has asked you to join this gathering, the Warwick Network for Parish Research. Since its foundation by members of the Warwick History Department in 2003, the network has sought to start dialogues with a wide range of independent scholars, community initiatives, and media organizations in the UK and continental Europe. Apart from our individual scholarly interests, the main goal has been to encourage and assist researchers outside the university system to relate their parish insights to wider historical issues and debates. Hence, we have thought, well before public engagement and impact became buzzwords in the academic system, to disseminate our research findings through different outlets, especially the provision of an online information platform, partnerships with archives, and collaborations on community projects. The founding members of the Parish Network, Warwick historians Bernard Capp, Steve Hindle, Peter Marshall, Penny Roberts, and myself, have all conducted extensive work on parish communities in the period between 1400 and 1700. Just a few examples appear here on the screen. Taken together and placed alongside all the studies that you've conducted, we hope to have contributed to a clearer understanding of themes such as the emergence of parish institutions, reformation change, gender relations, the multifunctional role of parishes, not just in the religious but also secular field, the delicate interplay between cohesion and conflict in local communities, and the interpretive potential of sources like church wardens' accounts or overseers' accounts. At the same time, of course, we have gained a lot in turn, for instance, through the discovery of new sources and the exposure to different local interpretations we encountered thus creating an increasingly differentiated picture of parish life in different confessional and regional contexts. In this symposium, we hope to build on and expand this existing exchange, given the multifunctional role of parishes, their long development, their countless different settings and cultural traditions, we greatly look forward to hearing about the ways in which other researchers study local communities. Here is just a sample of the many organizations, bodies, initiatives, and projects we have been fortunate to attract to our meeting. Alongside professional historians from the UK, continental Europe, and the United States, these include local history groups, particularly from the Warwickshire area, church conservation bodies, 
English and Italian archives, community and diocesan initiatives, arts projects, independent scholars, etc., etc. The hoped-for effect, in a nutshell, is the widening of horizons in several respects, chronologically, by taking us out of our normal comfort zone and encouraging us to engage with other, perhaps lesser-known periods. Empirically, by familiarizing us with a vast range of primary sources, many of which we've probably never studied um, intensively ourselves, and regionally by giving us opportunities to look beyond our normal spatial settings, enabling us to make comparisons, be it within a county, diocese, neighboring territories, or a long-standing ambition of the network in a wider European perspective. But enough of what the Warwick organizers think. What are you interested in, and what do you expect from this symposium? Here we can draw on a preliminary analysis of the dozens of online survey questionnaires you kindly submitted. Judging from this evidence, we have a majority of delegates with current interests in the English parish and the early modern period. Four among you have only just discovered the field of parish studies in the last 12 months, while six have been working in it for over 20 years. Very encouragingly, nearly three quarters haven't been to any of our symposia before. Networking emerges as a key target for the majority of respondents. Most also hope to gain new contacts. Half wish to get an idea of the wider context of the field, while many simply look forward to sharing ideas and getting fresh inspiration. Papers by academics, research students, and local history societies all attract about the same level of interest in these questionnaires. And several delegates explicitly welcomed the broadening out of the symposium audience and the bringing together of people from different backgrounds. In terms of future research plans, there's a dazzling range of themes with people planning to engage with topics ranging from family history and social networks via landscape studies and recusancy to conflict and spatial approaches. You can see that both the Warwick Network and our guests have high hopes and numerous different expectations of this weekend. Let's hope that we'll manage to deliver on at least a few of these in the next few days. What we can offer is a very colourful programme as shaped by the response to our call for participants. We have five plenaries, four workshops, one round table, over 50 paper sessions, uh, or 50 papers in the sessions, and 20 stalls. Hopefully alongside a lot of informal discussion over coffee, tea, meals, and the modern equivalent of the time on the church ale, that is social interaction in the Scarman Bar. Another key objective of the symposium, however, is to foster longer-term exchange. It would be a shame if, come Sunday, we'd all disperse into our various directions, never to communicate again. So what kinds of perspectives might our conference open up? Just a few um, ideas that come to mind. At the symposium itself, there's a roundtable on parish studies tomorrow, which reflects on the future direction of works and initiatives in our field. There are post-symposium questionnaires which we will invite you to complete after the event, which will hopefully give us a clearer idea what was good about this weekend, what we could improve on. Then we might want to continue our dialogue via the homepage of the parish network. And I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at that um, at some point in the past or maybe uh, before the symposium itself. Now, what we hope to do with the uh, network homepage is to provide an online platform for all sorts of uh, information and scholarly exchange. So, for instance, you'll find a bibliography with a long list of works in English, but also for those of you with European interest, works in other languages ranging from Catalan uh, via Polish uh, to Spanish. Then there's a page with projects, and we'd very much welcome to have uh, your projects highlighted here, basically just in the form of a one A4 page, uh, telling other people what kinds of parish-related work 
uh, that you're doing so that we are up to date about the many things that are going on. It may be interesting uh, to look at some of the online resources that now exist. We're trying to compile uh, what might be of interest um, to parish historians, including audio samples like these um, Lutheran hymns from the 16th century or um, other works from um, various periods, also reconstruction by different groups. We have visual records that may be of interest um, to many of you. Uh, church plans online with a great uh, number of different um, primary sources. Uh, we'll hear perhaps a little bit more also on Sunday from Martin about imaging the Bible in Wales uh, database, one of the big projects that um, he's been uh, looking after and the list could go on uh, forever. Odd little photograph, this is a reconstruction of a Swedish chapel in the National Museum at um, Stockholm. Perhaps there will be new ideas and initiatives, maybe research workshops, maybe consultancy of various sorts, perhaps even collaborations on specific projects. But a particularly tangible tool, we hope, is the creation of the Community My Parish platform, an online facility for everyone and every group with parish-related interests to post texts, images, sources, ideas, reflections, etc., we are grateful to the many of you who have already agreed to take part. And after this weekend, we'll start to develop the software, the layout, and the first content. And we hope to consult with you about what exactly such a site should provide. Finally, perhaps on Sunday, we can talk about whether another similar symposium of this kind might be useful or whether other things, um, other themes, regional workshop, etc., should be pursued. Now from the visionary and over-ambitious, perhaps, to the more mundane and pragmatic topics of practicalities, let me take this opportunity to make a few general organizational remarks for this weekend. You should have all received delegate packs, hopefully with an updated list of participants and also with a list of the venues and the sessions um, where they are taking place. All the meeting rooms are on the first floor of this building, so the whole range of proceedings will be happening here. Uh, sessions will be audio recorded and selectively also video captured, not to hold anything against anybody in the future, but uh, just to make sure that in case we or you would like to have access to this material, that it is possible to do so. Just try and ignore it. I guess that's probably the best way to go about it, but if you wish that nobody knows about your presence in this environment, then do <laughs> let us know and we can eradicate you from, from the record. <laughs> Refreshments are available in the lounge, which is called Lakeview, and off Lakeview, that area will be our uh, meals for those of you who want to take them. There's an internet cafe on the first floor. And I'm very grateful to the, those of you who have agreed to act as chairs for our sessions. Now, one thing that you will need to know is that these doors are all locking behind you automatically. So all the helpers will have one of these keys, which is needed to open the doors. But you may wish to keep them open during um, the sessions. Then we have um, podcasts here, MP3 players, as you can see here. As a chair, please make sure that they're switched on at the beginning of your session by double-clicking on it. If it's flashing red, that's no good. It has to be red stable um, to, to be recording. And please remember to switch it off at the end of, our, of your session as well. Chairs are also responsible, please, for timings to make sure that everybody gets a chance to present their paper and that also at least half an hour in each session is dedicated to discussion. Now, you may run uh, discussion straight after each paper 
or you may want to bundle them together and have a general discussion at the end. That's absolutely up to you and your speakers. Any further questions you may have, please go to Skarman Reception or one of our helpers here highlighted in yellow. Would you mind standing up, please, perhaps, to identify you um, to the audience? So this is Paula, Joanne, and Matthew and Agatha, who are available for any questions uh, that you may have. And they've worked very hard behind the scenes already. So many thanks to them for helping um, with this occasion. More behind the scenes, we have to thank Susan Dibbon from the Humanities Research Centre, who's prepared the whole conference packages, etc. John Morgan, who's analysing the surveys and doing some uh, post-symposium work for us. Robert O'Toole set up the whole software for online registration. And Don White has been very instrumental in the planning and organising of this, sadly. He can only be with us partially because he had an accident and is still uh, recovering. We're all very grateful also to our partner organisations, the British Association for Local History and the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture at the University of York. At Warwick, the Digital Change, GPP, the Humanities Research Fund and the Humanities Research Centre. Finally, I'd like to conclude on the most important message of all. Whatever the larger contextual issues, etc., I just hope that we'll have a good time this weekend, seize the chance to indulge in our passion for parish matters and simply enjoy the symposium. Thanks very much for coming and attending on this weekend.